global head commodities city and he joins us with his strategies for the year ahead. Edward, hi, good to have you. Well, what is the sense from the OPEC deal? Because this is the year we have seen official cuts now start. Saudi cuts are at a two-year lows and that definitely should have been a positive. But what is your sense on the members who are not cutting? Because we've also seen a ramp up in production coming especially from producers like Canada and US. I think there's an optical illusion in what you're saying. Uh, to be sure, uh, the bulk of OPEC countries, and particularly the main ones, have cut production. That's true of the big guys, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the UAE. Uh, it's true of Russia. The evidence is very clear that Russian production is down as well. The noise in the system is really coming from two Middle East countries. Uh, they're coming from Iran and Iraq. Uh, and I think it's more noise than anything tangible. Uh, on the Iranian side, it's mostly coming quite clearly out of inventory that was floating, is now being cut. There's no evidence of any growth of uh, any significance in Iranian production, nor do we expect there to be over the course of the year. So we think that'll settle itself out. Uh, and similarly, Iraq uh, has more loadings out of Basra than were expected, uh, but that's following a period of time in which the loadings were low. Uh, so to be clear about the OPEC agreement, uh, with non-OPEC countries. It's not an agreement to be assessed on a month-by-month -month basis, although clearly watching happen, what happens by month is important, but rather it's an agreement such that through this six-month period of time that started on January 1, average production will be going down by the stated amount according to the target for that six-month period of time. For some countries, uh, that's going to be uh, bulked up is going to be concentrated in the latter three months of this six-month period of time. Uh, the really clear evidence of the big production going down uh, is from Russia and the main GCC countries. Uh, and I think the, that's what the market will be focusing on as inventory data come into the system later on in February and March. Well, yes, it's a wait and watch mode on that one, Edward. But what is your sense on the price outlook? Because we have this varying range between 45 to 65. What is your sense for this quarter, the rest of this year? Oh, I think the range is going to be bumpy. So uh, we're always uh, uh, mindful of the bump. And indeed, our projected price for the first quarter is $50 a barrel Brent. Brent has been uh, averaging higher than that so far in the first quarter. Uh, our $50 number clearly uh, expects uh, that there's going to be a bumpy ride ahead. Just looking at loadings uh, and contrasting that with deliveries. So deliveries coming into China, South Asia, or into North America are deliveries from crude oil that was lifted uh, as uh, far back as November. It's not going to be until March that we see uh, a very clear sign that the cutback starting in January uh, is impacting delivered crude in a delivered market. So we've got to expect this noise as a kind of reasonable uh, factor in the market, but there's no doubt from the loadings perspective that loadings are going down uh, and we expect the market to continue to balance and tighten up with an inventory draw every single quarter of 2017. Hmm. Edward, uh, let's shift focus now to the precious metal space and the gold prices as well have started 2017 on a positive note. What's your sense? Uh, will we continue or will we be able to hold these gains ahead? Actually, when we look at the PGM group, we would, uh, we would actually select palladium and platinum well above either silver or gold. Uh, and that's because they're responding to not a monetary or financial market, but to a real supply and demand market. And we think uh, catalyst demand is going to rise. Uh, we're just coming off a period in, in which we've seen spikes in prices of oil and uh, platinum, palladium and copper. And, uh, and we think uh, uh, we'll see those again as the market really does tighten up uh, for those commodities, but not so much uh, on, the, uh, on, on the gold and silver side. Uh, because they, they have been, on the gold side, more reflective of uh, monetary and financial conditions and on the silver side um, as kind of the retail outlet for the institutional outfit, outlet for gold. Hmm. Edward, 2016 was uh, uh, all about positive money coming back in case of commodities. When it comes to 2017, what is your best bet when it comes into this sector? Would you rather go for metals or is it going to be precious metals? Or as you said, it's going to be a bumpy ride for crude. Yeah, we see the run continuing with uh, one a big exception, and that is the, the bulk commodities, so iron ore, thermal coal, coking coal 
saw spectacular jumps of 100 to 200, 300 percent uh, in terms of prompt prices. We don't think that had anything to do with fundamentals. They were outperforming commodities through 2016. Now they're coming off finally again. We think the, um, the, the performance of the bulk commodities was related to speculation on Chinese exchanges, related to uh, dysfunctionality in the management of uh, the Chinese economy, which fed into that uh, speculation. But the underlying uh, phenomenon in the supply-demand basis for the bulk commodities is bearish. So we think we'll see the prices of them coming off. We think wheat uh, and soybeans are uh, not going to go anywhere. But for the metals, we think what we saw in 2016 will uh, grow even more so in 2017. And the same thing with oil and natural gas. We're looking at Brent printing a $65 average price uh, in the fourth quarter, which means periods of time in which it will be trading above $70. We have a great confidence in uh, that forecast for uh, not just oil, but for copper and nickel uh, and zinc. And, uh, uh, and honestly, the fundamentals really look much stronger than they have uh, at any point since 2011 and the time of the MENA spring. Hmm. Edward, you clearly have a very bullish call continuing for the metal space. But as you also pointed out, that the China demand would be an important thing to watch out for. The U.S. has been talking about infra spending also. So between China and U.S., where do you see the major cues coming from? Yes, we certainly do see uh, Chinese demand going up. In general, it's going up because uh, China has become an intermediation center, a, uh, a processing world, importing uh, more commodities, processing them, and exporting. So this is true in oil, importing more, having huge capacity to refine and exporting refined product. But the same is true in copper. The same is true in iron ore with the transformation uh, into steel. So uh, we, uh, we think aside from uh, that process, uh, the, the new five-year plans uh, are fairly impressively concentrated on uh, fixed asset investment of a sort uh, that's going to see copper demand growing. Copper demand growing not just from uh, the perspective of white goods and, uh, and automobile sales, but uh, for the uh, transformational rebuilding of both the transmission grid and the distribution of electricity, which is incredibly copper intensive. So we think uh, copper imports will uh, grow uh, above the levels they were, uh, and that was pretty healthy growth uh, in 2016, um, and the same for most other industrial metals. Your point is well taken, Edward. We'll let you go at that. So that's a view coming in from City Rally. Very bullish.